Hi and welcome to this video here on my channel where we talk about interesting parts of the Summa Theologia by St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm Dave Palmer and this is a interesting topic. I hope you'll enjoy this as we talk about St. Thomas Aquinas' teaching in the Summa Theologia about the animals and by that I mean the irrational animals, the brood animals as he calls them and I'm not able to talk about all the treatment of it. Uh, there's more than this but these are just a few of the passages from articles that I found interesting concerning St. Thomas Aquinas and the animals. And first of all, we'll go all the way back to the creation account. Thomas spends time in the prima pars, first part of the Summa, talking about each day of creation. And on day six, of course, this is where God has already created the fish and the birds and the plants to some degree as well. And on day six, we know that first man was created and also the other land animals and so this is where we'll begin in our treatment of Thomas on the animals and he says the different grades of life which are found in different living creatures can be discovered from the various ways in which scripture speaks of them as Basil says the life of plants for instance is very imperfect and difficult to discern and hence in speaking of their production, nothing is said of their life, but only their generation is mentioned, since only in generation is a vital act observed in them. Okay, so pretty basic life in the plants and the trees and the flowers and that kind of thing. So he's saying, you know, scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about them other than just their generation, you know, that they came to be. All right, but among animals those that live on land are generally speaking more perfect than birds and fishes not because the fish are devoid of memory as basil upholds and augustine rejects but because their limbs are more distinct and their generation of a higher order of course arms and legs are better than wings and you know fins you know that's what he's getting at and so there's something higher about the land animals than the fish and the birds is what he's saying Okay, and let's see, uh, yet some imperfect animals such as bees and ants are more intelligent in certain ways. And so he's starting to talk about particular creatures, particular animals. Notice also how much he leans on his predecessors, the Basils, the Augustans, the Aristotles, the Jeromes, the Damascene, constantly quoting these church fathers, pagans, Jews, Muslims, anybody that came before him that was intellectually notable, Thomas was very interested in, okay? Uh, let's see, scripture therefore does not call fishes living creatures, but creeping creatures having life, whereas it does call land animals living creatures on account of their more perfect life and seems to imply that fishes are merely bodies having in them something of a soul, uh, whilst land animals from the higher subject uh, perfection of their life, as it were, living souls with bodies subject to them. Okay, so interesting distinction. He's not denying that fish and birds have souls, but it's a different type of category and a different level of perfection. And then but the life of man as being the most perfect grade is not said to be produced like the life of other animals by earth or water, but immediately by God. Okay, so again, he's trying to make a distinction between all these creatures and how scripture speaks of them. So let's move on now. Interestingly, in the same article, Thomas asks about the, poison the poisonous, the venomous creatures and whether they could have existed even before the fall. Now, a lot of people say, well, before the fall, there were no venomous snakes or poisonous frogs or thorns or thistles, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Of course, we know that, well, that's not the case. Thomas goes on to say that, yes, they did exist, but listen to what he says here. It's really interesting. Uh, like this venomous, you know, snake, obviously with big fangs, right? He says, in the words of Augustine, if an unskilled person enters the workshop of an artificer, he sees in it many appliances of which he does not understand the use, in which, if he is a foolish fellow, he considers unnecessary, right? Moreover, should he carelessly fall into the fire or wound himself with a sharp-edged tool, he is under the impression that many of the things there are hurtful. Um, 
Okay, whereas the craftsman, knowing their use, laughs at his folly, and thus some people presume to find fault with many things in this world through not seeing the reason for their existence. For though not required for the furnishing of our house, these things are necessary for the perfection of the universe. And since man before he sinned would have used the things of this world conformably to the order designed, poisonous animals would not have injured him. Very interesting. Okay, so would the, the venomous snake have existed, the poisonous frog, the, the, the black widow, the brown recluse spider? Thomas is saying, yeah, they would have, but man and animal would be, being perfectly ordered, they would not have been a threat uh, to man. He would have used them properly, and they would have had some kind of function in the big picture, which I find interesting. All right, so are the, the souls of brute animals subsistent? In the treatise on man, Thomas explains the human soul as being subsistent, which means that it can live on its own. Okay, if the man, if when a man dies or a person dies, the soul and the body separate, the body stays here, the soul flies off to heaven, but it's subsistent. So here he's asking, well, what about animals? Is that the case with them as well? Here's how he comes down to that. He says, the ancient philosophers made no distinction between sense and intellect and referred both a corporeal principle. Plato, however, drew a distinction between intellect and sense, yet he referred both to an incorporeal principle, which means outside the body, maintaining that sensing just as understanding belongs to the soul as such. From this, it follows that even the souls of brute animals <clears throat> are sub subsistent. So Plato would have believed that souls of dogs and cats and caterpillars uh, would be subsistent, right? Uh, not Aquinas. Why so? Because Aristotle held that the operations of the soul of the operations of the soul, understanding alone is performed without a corporeal organ. Okay, so we need a bodily organ to see, to touch, to smell, to taste, to, to hear, but not to understand. That doesn't require even the brain. The understanding is outside uh, the corporeal organ. Okay, on the other hand, sensation and consequent operations of the sensitive soul are evidently accompanied, uh, accompanied with changes in the body, thus in the act of vision, the pupil of the eye is affected by a reflection of color and so with the other senses. Hence, it is clear that the sensitive soul has no per se operation of its own and that every operation of the sensitive soul belongs to the composite. So a, a dog or a cat or a caterpillar or a butterfly have a composite, soul body composite, but when one dies, they both die. The soul does not live beyond the body as is the case of the human being. Wherefore, we conclude that the souls of brute animals have no per se operations. They are not subsistent for the operation of anything follows the mode of its being. Okay, so there's a difference between humans and <clears throat> the, uh, the brute animals. Okay, finally, and again, these aren't all the articles about animals, but these are the, some of the ones that I think you find interesting. At the very end of the Summa, when he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, the, re the resurrection of the body, he asks whether plants and animals will remain in this renewal. Okay, at the end of the world, when we have the final judgment, the general judgment, and um, of course all angels and human beings continue to subsist, their souls, or their spirits, what about the plants and the animals? Okay, what about Fido? Is he going to continue to exist at the end of time? Now, controversially, Thomas says, no, he will not. And here's why. Uh, if plants and animals are to remain, either all of them will or some of them. If all of them, then dumb animals, which had previously died, will have to rise again, just as men will rise again. But this cannot be asserted, for since their form comes to nothing, as we just talked about a moment ago, they cannot resume the same identical form. On the other hand, if not all but some of them remain, since there is no more reason for one of them remaining forever rather than another, it would seem that none of them will. But whatever remains after the world has been renewed will remain forever, generation and corruption being done away with. 
Therefore, plants and animals will all together cease after the renewal of the world. <clears throat> so according to Thomas Aquinas, there will no longer be any, any animals. You know, of course, we're animals, but no irrational animals, no dumb animals, brute animals, as he calls them, after, you know, the consummation of the world. And so obviously not everybody agrees with this, but this is how Thomas comes down in this. All right, last paragraph here. Further, if the end cease, these things which are directed to the end should cease. Now, animals and plants were made for the upkeep of human life. Wherefore, it is written in Genesis 9:3, even as the green herbs have I delivered all flesh to you. Therefore, when man's animal life ceases, animals and plants should cease. But after this renewal, animal life will cease in man. Therefore, neither plants nor animals ought to remain. <clears throat> okay, just reiterating in a different way. What he said in the first paragraph is that all animals are at the service of man. Okay, they are here to help us in one way or the other. Either we eat them or they provide companionship or, you know, one way or the other, they're going to help us out to achieve our final end. But once our final end has been achieved, there's no longer a need for them. So he's saying animals will not exist at the end of time. Okay, that is it. Uh, key passages on animals in the Summa Theologia by St. Thomas Aquinas. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, there will be more to come. God bless you.